Well, uh, geophysical inverse theory has a special place in my heart because first of all, everything we earth science do is related with geophysics. We deal with something that we cannot see directly. So we have to take measurements outside and figure out what it is. So I knew that geophysical inverse theory was important. Uh, when I went to study graduate school at MIT, uh, there was a professor named Ted Madden. He was a physicist by uh, origin, but uh, a famous seismologist, Keiaki. New he, Madden, Professor Madden, Ted Madden, said he did not know about invert theory because he was a physicist at MIT, uh, but it was Keiaki, a scientist from Japan, who taught him about the inverse theory. So we are all really excited to learn about this inverse theory from the great man. But Professor Madden is very bad at lecture. So it really, really screwed up our mind, you know, because uh, thinking about n-dimensional things in, was difficult itself, but, you know, but I always felt guilty that I did not understand invert theory. But it was a physical oceanographer, Carl Wunsch, he's a physical oceanographer. He understood theory and that's where I learned. One other thing was that in 1956, this, my hero, Cornelius Lanzos, he's a Irishman. And he wrote a book called Applied Analysis. And this book really, inspired me and changed. This was before the age of computer. And he described how to calculate matrices. Uh, Overdetermined under problem system and what kind of problems are in. So I think you physicists should, this book is cheap Dover edition, can get inspiration from this work by great men. And I think this is really what mathematics is about, you know, being few steps ahead of your time, okay? Well, another thing that inspired me was this very complex paper by Albert Tarantola. Albert Tarantola was a, a geophysicist at IPGP and this uh, paper was very complicated, but it's basically the essence is how do you, how does one update one's information? There's a figure here, which I uh, scanned and uh, because it's the quality is not good, but bear with me, please. So uh, when you have your knowledge shown here as a, big dash line, and then your knowledge has certain uncertainty. Everything in the world has uncertainty. There's nothing perfect. And then you have data and the data has uncertainty. So this dash line is what your view of the world was before any observation, but data comes in. And then, then how do you adopt your model to, how do you update your information? Well, isn't this what you would do? You would find a, where there is data, you would perturb your knowledge. And wow, it's not just mathematical, it's just common sense. So geophysical inverse theory borders on uh, human basic knowledge, our way of understanding the world. So even though I said geophysical invert theory, it's like common sense, all human. If we did not know invert theory, essence of invert theory, we would not exist. Now, the final part of my uh, first part, I think I'd say to people, computer is cost gift to people with disability. We all use computer, but this really helps people with disability because it can be many things. 
Um, we normally say when people with disability have three difficulty, we basically classify economic difficulty, social difficulty, and conflict within family. But making them uh, more independent, providing job, to get a job, you need education. Then you can improve the lives of different students with disability. Not, I mean, the problem with disabilities is all disabilities are slightly different. So there is no one for all solution, but at least we can take a bite out of a certain part. And this is my philosophy, has been education, job, and then independence for better living. Uh, now here uh, in Korea, because of government social welfare program, um, people with disabilities are employed to do very menial basic job with low wages. Thanks to this AI age, this event detection and object detection, this is very boring. So people, normal people don't want to do this. So there are, there are now companies in Korea where they employ people with disability to object detection, which goes as a uh, cloud background information for um, automotive driving and all this AI related fourth industrial revolution, this big dam of data science. And so what, in order to benefit from artificial intelligence in New York, you have to make the data into digital form so that somebody can copy and download from the computer to run their software. And this business called data labeling is something that they do. People were impressed. I went even further. Now for me, typing on the keyboard is very difficult because I have to press one by one. And as the real programmers don't use graphic user interface or mouse, they do everything with shortcut on keyboard. So what happens is that they end up injuring their uh, hands. Uh, and so, I have a way of judging whether you are a good computer programmer or not. I said, do you have a hand injury? If they say, no, you're an amateur. If you have a serious hand injury, then you are a professional. So, because everything is done on keyboard and as you were aware of, there are graphic user interface and this is fundamental to all high level programming. Now, I found out that several real professional programmer could not use their hand because they overused it. The guy here can only type 15 minutes a day. So for their own use, they develop a system called voice coding. This is not to help people with disability, but for their own use. And I show you on the left is a complicated uh, Python code. And on the right is something doing this with voice. No, I'm sorry. Abilities. This is using vem input as well. All right, here goes. This works. Phrase import space. For all system, exit, Mac, enter. Windows, Linux, and everything. State no. import phrase logging, enter. State import phrase OS, enter. Args quote phrase void space args phrase engine space star comma tip char star comma const tip uint eight star comma tip size. Right, right quote r paren. Enter. Looks right, right. S delete, state def, escape, zero, ship cap. Okay, um, I'll let you uh, follow the remainder yourself, but I, it takes less than about 10 minutes for this guy to complete all this task. And what's even better is that somebody with having difficulty pronunciation, this voice engine adapts to their 
uh, language use and so can even help people that have difficulty pronouncing. State deaf down. Now let's see. Okay. Uh, can you see this now? Okay. So, uh, so what I'm trying to do is to, this is the data of public data collected by a British industry and government on, um, of, to look for oil. And I am now training a team of severely disabled person with the funding from a, a foundation so that they can uh, make these data all available. I mean, this is an example in UK, but in Korea, all the government data that belongs to government available for public so that they can extract new knowledge. So uh, that's the end of my first part. And I, what do you do with $35 million? Well, I used to take students with disability around the world, around Korea, and every year take them to um, overseas places. And obviously computation is very important in aviation. And so I went to uh, one place I visited was Boeing where, you know, you cannot make a plane and say, oh, let's adjust the wing a little bit. You know, you have to get it right at the first time. So uh, that's, uh, this is a picture after we visited Boeing. Now I move to the second part of my lecture, which has uh, less slides. No, this was the first part. I, uh, oh, I ended up. Uh, uh, shutting down the second part. So let me just. I'm doing this all myself without the help. So you can see the power of computer. So you would understand why I'm saying computer is God's gift to people with disability. It was meant for people like me. And you are just borrowing from us. So uh, as I mentioned before my testimony in parliament in 2015, Korea had research vessels, but everything was uh, used by government and um, academic community did not have access. We have the ship icebreaker and this thing. But in 2015, I was summoned up to the parliament and asked to testify against the government on this practice. Because I was very fa famous, no minister would go against me. That was very big, uh, very against. Um, uh, so I had a public fame. But up to this point, I only help people with disability. And I didn't know how much far I can go for earth science community. So this was a trial for me. After my testimony, Nature article published an article that says Korea opens up its ocean science and it describes my uh, my act. Initially, I will I became public enemy number one because uh, everybody thought I was breaking the community, but. Right now, 
with the ship every year, Korean academic communities are able to not only cover the Pacific, but all the way to Indian Ocean. This is done every year. And, and so I, a new law was passed, new law, shared, shared use of the research vessel. And law is quite powerful and they have to do this. And I made a home run, a history. Let me go, what is the inverse problem? Well, inverse problem, you don't just start with anything, but you have a uh, model that can be your a priori information and you have data and your idea is solve basically A X equal B problem, A matrix, B X vector. So it's just a linear algebra, very simple. But when a professor and when your advisor said, hey, Sengmo, please solve this A X equal B, you're not supposed to solve this. Instead, you are so supposed to solve A X equal lambda X eigenvalue problem. The reason is that we don't really care about the solution. We care about the structure of the problem. So I said, when, you, when your professor advisor tells you to solve AX equal B and you solve this, you will never graduate. But when you become smart and then solve this problem, you will say, your professor, hey, Sengmo, we'll give you the degree. And this is very important and I cannot stress the importance of uh, this inverse theory and the way it works as a basic human way of understanding nature and phenomena describing things. But in machine learning, everything is lumped into a small chapter called regression. Of course, fitting a line through the data is invert theory, but I was appalled by when I talk with engineers and mathematicians, they all say, yeah, well, it's no, no, it's much more than that. You know, you are missing the fundamental way we conduct science. So when you do global tomography, you need, uh, you need to understand observation and you use invert theory. One good way is uh, global tomography. Another, the important, the reason I praised Cornelio Lanzos is that uh, everything, it, all the matrix problem, you're never given a square matrix to invert and come up with solution. It's either overdetermined or underdetermined. And uh, you'd seldom use this, but he philosophized a way of understanding all this problem under the name of singular value decomposition. So I tell people, if you understand SVD, then there's nothing else to learn. Just drop linear mathematics class. So, but then there is everybody is talking about deep machine learning and learning how great it is. And so, well, I like to be on the band, but I have, I'm, I'm skeptical. Well, uh, for, for one, we don't have enough data. So what people do is that they use some kind of numerical simulation to make artificially more data so that this can feed into uh, machine learning or deep learning, okay? Of course, uh, the data itself can give us ridiculous answer. So in some try to improve this by selecting a sample of data, whether it matches with simulation so that we have a control on the outcome. The reason I say this is that if you just rely on data, you don't know where you and en be ending up. Okay, you can be really stupid because many things in Earth are not yet observed. So, basically, in my view, uh, to understand linear inverse theory, I think I think machine learning is very good because machine learning, unlike deep learning, there is a theory behind it and. 
there is a rich flavor of uh, theory. For instance, if you want to understand uh, uh, singular uh, well, support vector machine, there is a beautiful mathematical story and theory behind it. Decision tree, entropy, and all this thing. Basically, machine learning is okay, but I have trouble accepting deep learning. Uh, maybe I'm not that smart, but anyway, uh, it's basically optimization of data. So this is, as you know, familiar program of uh, deep learning neural network. You try out and you, because you know examples, what, where it works, you back propagate it and to try adjust the coefficient. So it's basically linear algebra in different disguise. But when it gets complicated, it's like a black box. Everybody think it's like a black box. And some and I, 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 if I gave a positive spin of it, I tell people, you know, when the final element method was created, engineers knew how to use it, but mathematics, mathematicians had difficulty understanding. So maybe it's like final element. Maybe the practicality goes first and then the theory follows. What they do is that using all this data, what they do is that here is a what basic essence of uh, deep learning and all this thing. Here we have a round and uh, blue and green symbols. It's hard to differentiate, draw lines to uh, draw the border using straight lines. What they do is that make some transformation and things like, so that these two sets of data apply same thing are discernible in some M-dimensional, M-dimensional way, which is difficult for us to visualize that, but we have to uh, believe that. So basically it's about classification and dividing. So if my data fox follows here, it'll be dog, if here it'd be cat or whatever. But as I said, this kind of method works when there is convolutional neural network, reinforced uh, neural network, all works well when there is a lot amount of data and image. So I think the atmospheric science is the greatest beneficiary of uh, artificial intelligence as we understand at the moment. Now, uh, some issues, we don't need an accurate answer. We have to ma make decision quickly. Like if there's an earthquake, what do we do about it? These kind of things, when you need uh, action immediately in real time, almost real time, that's when uh, deep learning becomes important. The accuracy is not a matter. You, you have to make quick decision. But here is, some failures, I, here, it says, it's here, it's written in Korean. Well, it says machine learning identified this as deep learning identifies pick, but add real, little bit of noise. And when you show this, they said, it's an airplane. Here, banana, but they say it's a toaster. It says it's a stop sign, but it says speed sign to go 45 kilometers per second. So it can, with a small data, it can do a miserable job. Also, it cannot be generalized because here you have the problem, you change brightness or you do, you change the grid size, then it becomes, it cannot adjust. It becomes a whole new set of problem. And I think this is why we need so many data scientists because uh, millions of them will be working on a different size pixel problem. Uh, not 18 by 18, but one will work on 20 by 20. So of course, so I think inability to, to generalize because we don't understand the working of it is a big serious issue. Now, here you have the Google, I mean, the uh, Tesla car, 
bumping into uh, a van because they did not understand what this was. So now there is a strong movement because sometimes in, like in medical science, the ability to explain is very important. So there are now uh, areas for interpretable machine learning and explainable AI, but I think this is not full force yet, okay? This is just starting, but still a lot needs to be done. I think this all comes down to how do you add a priori information to make sure that AI does not give crazy solution. I showed you this picture by Albert Tarantola. We have the dash line as a priori information and we have data. So we do a reasonable job of updating. I think this is the important shortfall of machine learning, deep learning, whatever. We need way to provide guidance, a priori, so-called a priori information. Uh, again, I said, we never have enough data. And um, so although I teach computational science, I'm not a great fan of it, except for uh, pedagogical and educational purpose. If you, people ask me, what inspires you? I said, not machine learning. Now, what inspires me is the mystery of plate tectonics. Uh, there is a problem called LAB, uh, lithosphere athenospheric boundary issue. Uh, we know that crust and bowl and mantle, there is a very well-defined, seismically well-defined bowl. But the real physical action takes place at the boundary of lithosphere and athenosphere. So they call this LAB, lithosphere, athenosphere boundary. But the problem is that this boundary is not sharp and well-defined. It's very hazy. So with the development of measurements and instruments, before this problem was intact, uh, was not treatable. Now it's becoming feasible. So I participated bringing my ship, okay, together with the very professional uh, scientists from Japan at University of Tokyo, ERI, our competitor. I mean, they don't think us as competitor. And with Korean ship and Japanese instrument, we went to the oldest piece of the Pacific and for one year made broadband OBS and OBM measurement. Why we chose here is that way, way back ago in Jurassic, when the Pacific was forming, the plate moved in different direction than now. Now it's along the East Pacific rise, but before there was a triple junction and it moved differently. So if we are good enough, we can see two different LAB. And if we've discovered that this will be a remarkable achievement. So this project was called Pacific Array. And we are working on this. Now, this was instrument that was used on Korean ship. And after, I mean, OBS, ocean bottom seismometer has a long history, but when it comes to deep ocean bottom electromagnetic sound, which will provide us information, not on rigidity, but on the conductivity and resistivity, electrical property, the flow property, fluid like property of ocean, not match has been done. So this is a very uh, cutting edge field. I had my student look at this data, collect it over a year, analyze it, and he found out, guess what? None of them, his data did not fit anything. So, well, it's like a person touching the elephant. 
you know, when you have just one observation, you can claim. But as you have more observation, Earth is definitely more complicated than this two layer, three layer model it has. Convection, melt, hydration, cracks, and all this thing. So I said, wow, this is really great when everything did not go according to our prediction. That motivates us to do more. So what do we do? We have to develop the next generation of instruments of earth science. And this is what real physics is, is about. Now, I popped this for, for interesting reason. There was an earthquake and this earthquake was observed at land station and two OBS sites, same earthquake. On the normal ocean bottom seismometer, you, you have a lot of noise in horizontal component because of movement of uh, water, current and wave, it's very noisy. You cannot get land quality. Using this, what, using this kind of data, your result will be hazy. You will not be able to decision what is the right model. So, I, I have really respect for this Japanese scientists. They come up with a very complex system where they were able to decouple the logger, battery, and the sensor in mid water so that uh, water current will not affect the sensor. And this, this is not yet there. This is the prototype of their model. And so these kind of improvement will really help us to understand Earth. Also, there is OBEM, the, where you measure the electric field across these poles. And so uh, there are issue in the Pacific, but, you know, I have, through my heroic effort, facing the firing squad, I can now go to Indian Ocean every year. And in Indian Ocean, there is this problem of how a uh, hotspot interacts with mid ocean ridge. This is a classic ridge plume interaction. And French scientists and German scientists have done a lot of work in this area near Reunion Island. And they could see the hotspot, the plume magmatic plume from reunion affecting the mid-ocean ridge. But when we did a survey in the north, we could not see that hotspot. We think we are seeing a hotspot coming up from East African Ridge, a far region, much deeper, but we are seeing this. It's shown in passive regional seismic tomography but there is no way to prove this. So the reason I'm really keen on developing instrument is that I will take this instrument and go here and see whether the plume is coming from reunion hotspot or it's that big massive plume that is splitting the East African rift, a far plume all the way down, you know? This, these kind of things are like, questions that it's like looking at another point on another planet. Huh? This is the, at the level of Carl Sagan, in my view. Okay. So um, we will, first I have to develop instruments because to do this, I need a lot of instruments and deploy them for a year or more. It's like videotape. Nobody will rent your videotape for one year. Only a block box, blockbuster, five, 10 days at maximum. So I need my own instrument. And this is the area that I will be looking at. Another area that I'm looking, going to look at is Alaska Allusion Arc. You know, uh, United States is very afraid of big tsunami. And it turns out that USGS in the under the 
budget cut restrainment in the 80s, they had two research vessels, they got rid of it. So they got good grading for uh, economic, I mean, for being a saving budget, but they got rid of the ship. Now they need to ship, they don't have to ship. So they come to me, look at there, through the effort of Professor Lee, uh, Korean will become available. So I am going to save the property and uh, lives of American people. And, and this is just uh, my, uh, <laughs> my outrageous claim, but you know, because suddenly, because of my effort, Korea has suddenly a lot of ships, scientific ships. And so we can do this and we'll be, um, I mean, if there is any person who is in the spirit of interage, who wants to come and join our ship, we will uh, try to accommodate them. Now, the planet A. Uh, this is a very good book written by Charlie Langmuir and Wally Broker. It's called How to Build a Habitable Planet. It talks about the geochemistry to reach where the point we are. But we are ravaging our planet. Okay? So, no wonder. Science has helped to improve lives, but it's going to kill us. Also, there is a plan. Um, this is a wonderful book by Paul Collier called The Bo Bottom Billion. Now, uh, there are certain number of countries that are living well, and there are countries that will soon become better. But there are bottom billion that will never uh, become better. And his advice is that aid is not the problem. Inspiring local champions and giving them the power to change their own society, whether it takes time, is the key. So, well, it should be flipped, but here the yellow countries are those countries that are suffering. They're mostly in Sub-Sahara and some in Asia. And our ship goes from Pacific all the way here. So this is, say we, I'm telling people now, we are now in the, in the position to give out we used to receive foreign aid. Now we are in the position to give out aid. We need to um, build capacity of people in this region. This is a good way to help, not direct material aid. Well, material aid is also good, but this is not. So uh, with 1010 Project, I have started so-called data science competition to relate on earth science issues. And recently, several months ago, a big corporation in Korea, this is the third largest corporation, corporation in Korea, rank three at the moment. One of their subsidiary company called SKENS, which stands for Energy and Solution. They are in charge of uh, powering uh, electric power plants in Korea using gas. And so in this new era, they have to, adopt a new change and they approached me because I was so famous in Korea. No, I'm not, I'm a solid earth scientist. I'm, I, I don't have much uh, experience in environment, but you know, with my fame, they put me in charge so that they will invest every year, 15 to $20 million so that I can help uh, young companies to do important research and such like. So, one, another area that I'm focusing is not only data science, but to actually build hardware and instruments that we can deploy from the ship and make new ground, new understanding in earth science. So this is a good one is by DARPA, US Defense, and they do a lot of things and it's very strenuous and competitive. And also uh, I have this commitment in disability. So I use young kids with Raspberry Pi, Arduino, this embedded solution, single board computer to inspire them age 10 and 15 into science so that 
they will also be an important contributor of our human knowledge and effort. So this is my final slide. As Alec mentioned, it was 2020 postponed two years, will be next year. Hopefully we get better and be able to do this uh, offline, but please mark your calendar and I hope to see you there. Thank you. Thank you very much.